Hi everybody, indirect taxes are a form of government intervention and used in microeconomics for two core reasons. First of all, to raise government revenue, indirect taxes like VAT will do that. But also if we look at indirect taxes like cigarette duty, alcohol duty, fuel duty, sugar tax, carbon tax, fat taxes, taxes like that, those taxes are aimed to solve market failure, to reduce consumption, to reduce production of goods and services that do a lot of harm to society. So that's what those taxes are aimed at. In truth, there are two general types of taxes that governments can use. Indirect taxes, which is the core focus of this video, but also direct taxes. Let's go there first. Direct taxes are simply taxes on income that can't be transferred to anybody else. So good examples are income tax, national insurance, corporation tax. These taxes directly tax income, but we're focusing on indirect taxes. And we can see from this very precise definition exactly what indirect taxes are. They are expenditure taxes. That is an extra charge when goods and services are sold that increase cost of production for firms, but they can be transferred to consumers via higher prices. Hence, they are indirect. Let's focus there. Indirect taxes can be specific in nature or they could be ad valorem. What does this mean? Well, a specific indirect tax is a tax per unit. Take, for example, wine duty or alcohol duty. Wine duty, a tax per unit. So every single bottle of wine will have a tax, let's say, of £2.23 applied to it. Now, why is this important? Well, the way in which specific indirect taxes shift the supply curve is quite unique. Specific taxes shift the supply curve like this, parallel to S1 plus tax. Now, why is that? That is because the vertical distance between the two supply curves represents the value of the tax. So in this situation, the vertical distance here represents the fact that the tax is £2.23 per bottle. So it doesn't matter whether it's the thousandth bottle being sold or the hundredth bottle being sold, each bottle is taxed exactly the same, which is £2.23. So no matter where you look at that vertical distance, it's always going to be the same unit value of the tax. That's what a specific tax does, a tax per unit. Whereas an ad valorem tax is a tax as a percentage of the price being charged. What does that mean for the shift of the curve? Well, take VAT, which in the UK currently is 20%. Normally a percentage tax is VAT. The supply curve will shift pivoted from S1 to S1 plus tax. Now, again, the vertical distance between the two supply curves will represent the value of the tax, in this case, 20%. So if we look at it here, that's 20%. Even if we look at it down here, that's also 20%. So what are we trying to say? Well, we're trying to say that 20% of a high price is a high number. So 20% over here, let's say uh, the price is £100, that's going to generate £20 worth of revenue for the government. So even though the percentage is 20%, the amount of revenue collected by the government is quite high. Whereas over here with low prices, 20% of a low number, let's say £10, is only £2. So the amount of government revenue collected is low. So all we're trying to say is that, yeah, the vertical distance is always 20%, but 20% of a high price is a high amount of tax revenue collected versus 20% of a low price. So ad valorem taxes shift the supply curve pivoted to reflect that. Now, let's look at the key impacts of indirect taxes on a market. Well, here we have a market in equilibrium at P1Q1. Let's look at the impact of an indirect tax. Here is specific tax to keep our life quite simple. Well, we know an indirect tax will increase cost of production for firms. So the supply curve will shift to the left here from S1 to S1 plus tax. But if we're being hyper technical, we should really say the supply curve will shift upwards. And that is because the vertical distance here between the two supply curves represents, in this situation, the tax per unit. So when we talk about the supply curve, you can say it shifts to the left, but better say it shifts upwards from S1 to S1 plus tax. Okay, and that's why we get a new equilibrium at point B, P2, Q2. We can see that price is increased from P1 to P2 and quantity has decreased from Q1 to Q2. Great stuff, very simple. We know this already from our basic market analysis that we've done in prior videos. But we can go a lot deeper when we are studying the impacts of an indirect tax. What we can actually work out on this diagram is the amount of government revenue collected. And here's how you do it. You go to the new equilibrium, P2Q2, point B. 
At that equilibrium, work out the vertical distance between the two supply curves. So if I label that point C, BC is the vertical distance between the two supply curves. That is the tax per unit. We need to multiply that by all the units being produced and sold. That's all the units up to Q2. So BC multiplied by everything up to Q2. If I label this point here E, I'm going to put a label D there. So we can see that P2 BCE, that area represents the total government revenue. P2 BCE. I'll go through that again. You go to the new equilibrium. The vertical distance between the two supply curves is the tax per unit, that's BC, multiplied by all the units being produced and sold, that's everything up to Q2, gives you the area of that box. P2 BCE, that is the government revenue. We can go even deeper and we can work out how much of that revenue the consumer is paying and how much the producer is paying, what we call the consumer burden and the producer burden, another name, the consumer incidence, i.e. how much of that tax is falling on the consumer and the producer incidence, how much of the tax is falling on the producer. To work that out, you look at that government revenue box. Of that box, the difference in price portion is always the consumer burden. The only reason consumers are paying higher prices is because of this indirect tax, which is partly passed on to them via higher prices. So the difference in price part of the box is always the consumer burden. In this situation, that's the box P1, P2, B, D. That's the consumer burden. Whatever is left is the producer burden. So that's here P1 DCE. Superb. So we can see how much of the tax is falling on consumers and on producers. We can also work out producer revenue. Remember the equation for revenue is just price times quantity. So hopefully you can see that initially without the indirect tax producer revenue is just P1 times Q1 giving us the area P1 a Q1 zero. But what is it now with the indirect tax implemented? Well, you might think, you know, producers are charging P2, they're selling Q2. So surely it's P2 times Q2, P2B, Q2 zero. But remember, a lot of that area is actually going to the government via government revenue. We have to minus that off, minus off the government revenue. And we can see that producer revenue is only EC Q2 zero. So it's fallen, fallen to EC Q2 zero from P1A Q1 zero. So a big fall in producer revenue. And also by the government intervening, reducing quantity in this market, there is a deadweight welfare loss of the triangle A, B, C. If you guys click on this video over here, you will see a video where I explain why an indirect tax creates a deadweight loss and what the implications are of that. So fantastic, all these key impacts we can now see on the diagram. Let's see overall the impact on key stakeholders. Well, it's very clear that consumers will not like indirect taxes. And we can see from the impacts why indirect taxes raise price, they will lower consumer surplus, lowers quantity and lowers choice. Consumers are burdened by indirect taxes. At the same time, indirect taxes are highly regressive. They take a larger proportion of the income of low income households than they do of high income households. So all these negatives for consumers not liking this at all, we can evaluate even further and say, look, if demand is priced inelastic, the impact will be even greater. My next video is going to cover that in more detail. What about producers and workers? They're not going to like indirect taxes either. Focus on producers. We've already said how producers are going to see lower producer revenue. In truth, their producer surplus comes down as well. We can see how much they are burdened by indirect taxes, workers too. Uh, they potentially could lose their jobs. We know labor is a derived demand and with quantity falling, there is less need for workers to produce. So there is a good chance they could be harmed. What about the government? Well, in theory, the governments are going to like indirect taxes because they might hit their two key goals. If they're raising revenue, government's going to like that. We can see the revenue on the diagram. If they're solving key market failures or reducing consumption and production of goods and services that do a lot of harm to society, they're going to like the fact that they're solving those market failures, but they are not going to like the fact that indirect taxes have a lot of unintended consequences, the harm on consumers, the regressive nature of the indirect tax, the harm to producers, the fact that producers might shut down, they might leave the country, they're not going to like that at all. They're not going to like the fact that there might be black markets created by indirect taxes. For sure, that's going to be a terrible, terrible thing. So. The government has to bear all that in mind and be careful when they set indirect taxes. At the same time, we've seen that a deadweight loss can be created as well from indirect tax. 
So that is the key impact of indirect taxes. You can see how detailed we can go. In my next video, we're gonna look at how some of these impacts can change depending on elasticity. Make sure you stay tuned for that. Very interesting stuff. I'll see you in that video. Thanks for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.